Hey everybody, welcome to my next listing. Yep, this is what you're looking at. It is the king of the semi-automatic denims, the Holy Grail, the Mighty DP-59L. Man, this one's in fantastic shape. It's been recapped and restored. It's got a brand new SAE cartridge that I'm gonna go ahead and put on with it. It's ready to rock, man. Let's go ahead and take a look at the features and functions of this really, really in-demand machine. And speaking of in-demand, it is the great Snoop Dogg here visiting here. I mean, like, literally right in the way. <laughs> God, I love that dog. Anyway, as much as, you know, I love to see you guys get a turntable, you guys know the drill. If there's any way in your lives, your family can get yourself a good rescue dog, oh, my God, it'll change your life forever. Now, I know it's this holiday season, so, you know, don't do it if you really can't do it. There's nothing worse than a dog that gets out of a shelter and then, you know, the home doesn't work out. But man, if there's any way you can do that, man, look into getting a a rescue dog. They'll just change your life forever for the good. I mean, I'm very excited because he just went out and took a dump outside and it's midnight and there's nothing better than your dog taking a dump before you go to bed. <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, I hope you guys are great. Man. Let me talk about this turn real quick because I want to get to the artist. You guys, it's a 59L. It is in minty nice shape. It's been recapped and restored. I changed all the electrolytics out to Elna's and Nichicon's and Panasonic's. The motor's been lubed. The arm's been completely out of it. The bearings have been done. The CDS photo sensors have been changed. Um, the variable resistors have been set with a DVM. The motor waveforms with a scope. Switch is cleaned. The platter there has been polished with Mother's Mag Wheel Polish. It is in fantastic shape. There's a little mark right here that's been repaired. This, no, this is the glue spot. It was a little loose right there. And that's been just touched right back up. And that is it. The rest of this thing looks really, really empty clean. And if that's not enough, it's got a dark tinted dust cover on it. And it's got a brand new SAE 1000E uh, high output moving coil cartridge. My buddy Joe Long at cartridgeretipping.com turned me on to these things. He doesn't, he doesn't sell them, but there's a seller who's been selling new ones of these. And they were like, you know, 300 bucks when they were new. And I'm, you know, I'm getting them for 100 bucks. So I'm putting them on the, my turntables for hundred bucks. It, it's a good enough cartridge. It's more than good enough to go to 59 now. Now you can put anything you want on here. If you don't need this cartridge, we can talk about something different. But, you know, if you're, you know, to get it under your tree, plug and play ready. Yeah, it's just a really great, great sounding cartridge. So anyway, uh, if I can step over my dog and not hurt him. The artist I want to talk about today, I featured him a long, long time ago. And even back then, I, I you know, realized he was just a dark cloud <laughs> you know? but, anyway, you want to talk about somebody who did not want to be a star okay and just was just like the wrong guy for the job uh but he's just a fantastic artist a great songwriter amazing but one of the most distinctive voices ever had one of the biggest songs of the 70s uh let's go ahead and take a look and a listen at the great jerry rafferty so today we're featuring the great Jerry Rafferty. Like I said, probably the most, uh, <laughs> the worst candidate ever to be a rock star because they just, it just didn't suit him. But he was an amazing, amazing talent. He was born in 1947 in Scotland. Uh, his dad was a bus driver and a coal miner and an alcoholic. And his mom taught him like traditional folk songs. But once he learned about Dylan and the Beatles, like every kid in the 60s, he decided to go that route. So with his school buddy, Joe Egan, which we'll get to, it's kind of important. They formed a band uh, called the Mavericks. They played Beatles and Stones covers, right? Well, both of those guys joined a, another band called the Fifth Column that actually got to cut a couple records. So you got a little bit of a taste of that deal, right? And, uh, you know, but then they, they folded. So by 69, uh, he joined this folk trio called the Humble Bums, okay? Crazy name, but you'll get it in a minute. Uh, Along the other one of the other members of it was the great Billy Conley. So if you guys know anything about British humor or you know following kind of British humor at all, Billy Conley is like an icon. He's a he is Chris Rock level, you know, Seinfeld level, you know, huge comedian in the UK and probably Europe anyway. But you know, they were just a folk band at this point in time. And you know, when you read uh articles, interviews and stuff with uh Billy, he said that Jerry was actually the, the crazy funny one in the band, it wasn't even him. So, you know, just kind of kind of crazy like that, right? Well, they did, uh, after they did the first album, they actually became a duo, one of the, the third guy left, and they did a couple more records, and then by 71, they'd broken up. So, uh, he had cut a solo record called Can I Get My Money Back? 
<laughs> okay, very good. Okay, great record, really good record. I mean, one, my my favorite solo record of his, right? Uh, but you know, great reviews, poor sales. So he got back with his buddy uh, Joe Egan, and together they formed a band called Steelers Wheel. Now you probably you know heard of those guys because of the big song "Stuck in the Middle with You," okay which was a song about alienation and getting screwed by the record company. That's gonna, that theme's gonna stick here with us, just stick around, right? Well, anyway, Jerry was so disillusioned with the band that he quit before the song was even a hit. I mean, they released it, he didn't care, he left the band, and it climbed up the charts and became a big, huge hit. So they actually talked him back to coming back to the band. But by the time they got him back, the rest of the band had quit. They said, Fuck a bunch of Jerry Rafferty. So it was just basically him and Joe Egan again, left as a duo. So they st stayed on a Steelers wheel. They did two more albums, had another couple uh, top 40 songs. My favorite is Star. At least you should look that song up. It is, it, it's my actually favorite Steelers wheel song. It's a song about alienation getting, and, uh, you know, uh, not getting screwed by the record company, but by getting falsely, uh, <laughs> you know, but falsely propped up by the record company. So he's, He's got a little chip on his shoulder here for you see seeing a trend coming here, right? So anyway, after Steelers Wheel broke up, uh, unfortunately, there was a whole bunch of legal bullshit to the point where Joe and Jerry weren't allowed to record for three years. So when Steelers Wheel broke up in 75, it took all the way to 78 to get all the legal bullshit uh, worked out. But when they did, Jerry got another record deal and he made this album here called City to City. Okay, and it's about, I mean, the themes of this thing are about alienation and, you know, uh, the big hit that we're going to play Baker Street, you guys probably know, it, it's written about his train rides going back and forth to court. Uh, he had to stay around London because he kept on having all these court dates. And he was staying at a friend's house. It was on Baker Street. It was just about all the kind of sadness and weirdness and stuff that was going on in his world, man. So anyway, Baker Street has that distinctive sax solo. And we'll get into that because there's a controversy about that because I'll, I'll play that little bad song for you. But anyway, it got huge, okay? Baker Street went to number one. The album sold five million copies, okay? Just freaking, it was awesome, right? I mean, uh, his follow-up record was called uh, Night Owl. It went gold, which is still quite respectable, you know. Uh, but once you sell five million copies, anything less than five million copies... Some people think it's a disappointment. So, but anyway, it was still it was still really good, right? You know, uh, so he got a gig as a producer. He was friends with Richard Thompson, okay, and he started to produce Richard and his wife Linda's record. And like I say, I'm probably going a little bit deep here into the music business, but one of the most saddest, melancholiest, want to slit your wrist while you jump out of a building albums you've ever heard is Richard Linda Thompson's "Shoot Out the Lights." Okay, it's just a sad, tragic tale of lost love. And just, anyway, well, Jerry was the original producer on those sessions that later became uh, sh uh, Shoot Out the Lights. But they fired him. Richard, Richard fired him because he was too demanding and he was too melancholy. <laughs> okay. Holy shit, man. This guy is like schlep rock, right? Walking around. Anyway, so uh, like I said, from here, you know, it's none of this is humorous, but it's just weird. But from here, it gets really kind of kind of bad. Um, you know, his dad was an alcoholic. He, you know, kept feeling alienated and lost in his own skin and not right in the world. And he just kind of spiraled down into a, just a world of you know a bad alcoholism and drunken binges and busting up hotel rooms. He, he bought a castle in Scotland and never moved into it. Just all the craziness. That you could think of. Once his wife divorced him in the early nineties, um, yeah, he just really just went off the deep end, right? So, anyway, we still kept making some records, and they were they were great. But because he wouldn't tour, okay, he was just just did not want to get in front of people and play. And he never he never came to the states again. He never he never came to the states after I think eighty nineteen eighty. I think it was the last time. So he just didn't have audience right he might have a core few hundred people a few thousand people follow him but you know this is before the internet right but with that being said in in uh 99 he was one of the first guys to fully music guys to fully embrace internet marketing because he didn't want to leave his house 
So he literally sold his records and stuff through his website. Okay. He didn't really advertise it, didn't really promote it. He said in an interview that, you know, he didn't want to talk to any record label guys, 25 year old record label guys trying to sell uh, pop songs to 19 year olds. His artists, you know, his fans are mature and they all know where to find them. So he promised like to release all this new material, like release a new song every month kind of thing. But within a couple of years, the website had died. Okay. And like I said, just kind of kept getting worse and worse, spiraling down that hole, right? He, kind of, he just sort of disappeared, you know? There was rumors he was running around Italy, just, you know, he had a, he got a new Italian girlfriend, so he was running around Italy, and he was in and out of the hospital for liver failure. I mean, these are all rumors, but I think that both those stories are true, right? And, you know, he was, he was always in the press about, you know, whether well, he was wrecking a car or drunken binges or whatever. It was just really kind of sad. You know, and then in 2010, it really caught up with him. He, uh, at the end of 2010, he did get checked into a hospital. He had like massive, you know, organ failure and he actually started to bounce back and he thought he was going to make it. They thought he was actually going to make it and he, he goes home for Christmas. But then the, by January of 2011, uh, he, he, he died at his uh, daughter's house, uh, you know, complications from all the, you know, organ failure from all the alcohol, you know, so just a sad, terrible, fucked up story. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I, I can tell you more and more things. I mean, you know, those Steelers Wheel records were produced by Lieber and Stoller, okay? Normally I tell you guys, hey, there's a really iconic somebody involved with all these bands. I probably should have mentioned that. Lieber and Stoller were the guys who produced these Steelers Wheel records. You should stop the tape here. Go check those guys out. They were the two <laughs> Jewish dudes in New York who wrote all the cool songs that black artists discovered. They wrote Hound Dog, and they wrote Yakety Yak, and they wrote uh, Kansas City, you know? They were one of the first white songwriters who actually wrote songs specifically for black artists. It was really, I mean, they were very influential and, and very, um, very fucking cool for doing that, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, they produced these records, you know? But, you know, by the time Steelers we were broken up, they had, you know... They had gotten some legal troubles themselves, and you know they just you know and and honestly, Jerry was a lost cause, man. He was his own worst nightmare. If you don't believe me, just go YouTube any video of Jerry doing Baker Street. Okay, there's a couple of them out there. The first thing you'll find out is goes he they sounds fucking amazing live. Okay, he sounds just like his record. There's no, I mean, he's amazing. The other thing you'll see is he looks like he would rather be anywhere else, but in front of people playing music. It's kind of a dichotomy that's just kind of weird in rock and roll, man. So anyway, it's the great Jerry Rafferty. Let me go ahead and show you the features and functions of this turntable real quick. It's a 59 now. You know how it works. But we'll play a little bit of Baker Street here for you. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, sax riff there that was a little bit of controversy. Let's, uh, let's check it out. So I know you guys probably know how 59L works, but it's fun to watch them because they're just amazing, incredible machines. These are the only record players, I'll say only, but these are the first record players I would tell people that you're gonna stare at this thing when it plays a record because it just, it's mesmerizing. You won't be running the vacuum cleaner or dicking around the house. You're gonna like sit down with the record cover and stare at this thing and watch it play a record. And I've done over almost a hundred of these now, maybe actually a hundred if I think about it, 159 L's. And to a person, I think people are just, they're just amazing turntables. So anyway, the quick deal, you got a power button right here, it turns it on. That button there is your power button, but when it locks to speed, you hit this. As soon as it locks to speed, it comes right back on, and it's locked again, okay? And, of course, you hit this here, and it turns it off, right? You come over here. This turntable has the one thing you probably won't ever use, and that's a pitch control, okay? But it's got it. It's got digital freedom for 33 and for 45, and it's got the beautiful thing of you can go up and down in tenths of a percent, all the way up to 9.9% .9 up or 9.9% .9 down. So if you're, like, running this thing up and you got to way up a ways, you want to come back to, you know, instantly back to your set speed, hit normal, and it goes right back to your 33 or 45. You got speed selector here for 33 and 45. Then this right here is your lifter. When the light is off, it is up. When the light is on, it is down. Okay. And as I mentioned, this is a brand new SAE 1000E high output moving coil cartridge. It'll plug right into your moving magnet phono output. And it's like this is brand new. They sound great. Thanks again to my buddy Joe Long for, for turning me on to it. It's set up with my Fiker Protractor. It's ready to rock, okay? Come back here. This has a removable arm. This is a straight arm. You just unscrew this right here, and the whole arm pulls out. 
You can get an SR for it as an option, but because this thing has my favorite gun and servo tracer tracker arm, they tend to uh, ease compliance issues. So you don't have as much hassle running, you know, higher, too high or too low compliance cartridges with these. But you can get the S arm to take advantage of a little bit more, you know, uh, lower compliance you know, cartridge. So anyway, and you've got your anti scanning and your Q damping right here on separate knobs, right? Back here is your ballast style counterweight, and this is a regular counterweight. This, this arm does not servo really suck the arm down. What the servo does on this one is basically uh, runs the uh, magnetic for the anti skating, okay, and keeps that going. Right here, there's a hole that you put a screwdriver in to pick your end lift spot, but I've got that set for you as well. And man, that is it. That is basically a 59L. So let me go ahead. I'm going to play a little bit of Baker Street here for you. As I mentioned, kind of a controversy around that song and the riff and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you do a little bit more digger deeping than Wikipedia gives you, you can actually find out uh, more stuff that's going on. So let's go ahead and talk about Baker Street here for just a second. So Baker Street probably single-handedly brought the saxophone back to rock and roll. I mean, this, uh, this riff on this, the solo on this thing is so iconic. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been quoted and stuff. Matter of fact, Quentin Tarantino used the song in uh, Reservoir Dogs, and Jerry Rafferty was so disillusioned with the record business when uh, it went to come out on DVD and they was going to pay him big time to keep using the song. He wouldn't let him use it. He lost, he lost probably a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know. But you know, honestly, he was making $100,000 a year from royalties. Most of that from this song, even when he died. So that's how big a huge hit song can do for you when you still crack 100 grand a year 30 years after the fact, 35 years after the fact. But anyway... So Baker Street has this iconic sax riff. It was played by a guy named Raphael Ravenscroft, right? Now, he claims, or, he, or well, let's put it this way. He, supposedly in a day, he claimed that he actually wrote the riff, that riff for the song, and that Jerry Rafferty never paid him, like paid him like $47 for the session that he came up with that. And supposedly he took the check and he framed it and he put it in his office and he never even cashed it, okay? That was the famous deal about it, right? Well, Jerry doesn't give a shit about that stuff because he doesn't even want to really care. But it came out years and years and years, like, like after Jerry Rafferty died. They finally cornered this Ravenscroft guy because when they re-released City to City on digital and they found the demos, you can go to YouTube and find them. You can find your, Jerry's original demo to Baker Street, and he is playing that riff on the guitar. So now with that being said, Ravenscroft says he never ever did say that he did that. So... I couldn't find any direct articles that said he did, but I had I read articles that said that he had said that in articles. So with that being said, Jerry Rafferty truly wrote the riff and the guitar part. But Hugh Burns played the guitar part on the record, but in the in the uh, demo, it's all it's all Jerry. So anyway, without fail, let's listen to the great song. I'm, this is probably the shittiest record you guys are gonna hear me play. The, the, the quality of this record is just really bad. I mean, the record itself sounds amazing. This one's just got a bunch of static and dirt and disc and stuff. So we'll just get through a little bit of Baker Street and check it out. Even, even scratchy, it sounds great.
And anyway, that is the great Baker Street from Jerry Rafferty. You guys know, I mean, just a classic, iconic song. Classic, iconic turntable. Man, if you've been looking for a 59L, this is the last one I'm going to have for a little while. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll wrap up the, you know, the pricing and how you can get this thing in time for Christmas and all that fun stuff there. And we'll talk one more time to this new dog. Let's check it out. So he's twitching and dreaming. I love that dog. Anyway, with the dust covered down, ladies and gents, let's go to the map gonna tell you it is a minty nice 59l it's been recapped and restored did all the work to it it is ready to rock as i mentioned it is really really clean dust cover has a few marks because i quit spending four hours on a dust cover it does have one little actually i said it was this side before it's actually this side right here see that little right there there's a little spot that stuck out just put a little bit of drop of glue there and it's back to good but as you can see this thing is just <laughs> freaking cool just really really Freaking cool. So anyway, with that being said, this one here with the cartridge on it is going to be $1,450 plus the shipping. If you don't want the cartridge, it's $100 off. Like I said, you may want to have something different. You may want an Audio Technica or a Sumico or whatever. Or you may have something that you uh, already have. You can send it to me. I'll set it up for free with my Fikert Protractor, my fancy dancer Fikert Protractor. Anyway, um, like I said, uh, you know, with Christmas coming, a lot of times people are giving these as gifts. So it's just nice to have this thing plug and play ready when you open it up. Because you literally you can just cut some rubber bands, move a piece of foam, drop the platter on it, and hook it up in Bob's your uncle. That's really what it is. So anyway, man, guys, thank you so much again for checking this thing out. I really appreciate it. I think what is next is going to be a fully automatic Denon DP51F. And then I think after that is going to be a Pioneer... PL30L. That's a semi-automatic. So I think those are the next two coming. I'm probably going to do another, God, four or five turntables maybe for Christmas because we're having Christmas at our house this year. We weren't supposed to, but because of the Snoop Dogg, and actually most of our family members are getting old enough now where it's easier to bring their kids. You know, when the kids were little, you don't always want to go to where the kids were at because it just, you know, taking kids away from their presents on Christmas sucked. But now the kids are older and uh, they can come here and, and uh, you know, let me harass them. So anyway, man, thank you guys so much again. I so appreciate you. Email me with any questions. I still have that Pioneer, that PL450, that little uh, crazy uh, Pioneer that used to be a 520. That's still available too. That'd be a great gift for a, a, a kid or a second bedroom or a college room because it's fully automatic. It's just funky, cool, and it works great. So anybody needs a great deal on that for Christmas, and it's, it's very inexpensive. Check out that video. It's still on here as well. So thank you guys all again. So appreciate you. Take care. If you can get a rescue dog, don't get this turntable. If you can get a rescue dog and get this turntable, God bless you. You're winning in life, okay? But in the meantime, man, thank you guys again for the kind words. We'll catch up with you soon. Take care, everybody.